Well, welcome everybody again to our Sunday Soapbox. Um, today's topic is God is always working and uh, we're going to be hearing from Guy. Uh, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, but Guy, recently your wife Karen had what looked to be at first a reasonably serious problem with her heart. Can you share with us a bit about what happened? Yeah, thank you for that, Lono. Um, so Karen had been well, unwell for about eight weeks at this stage, and she had been having a at rest heartbeat of around 120 beats per minute. Um, we'd been to the doctors a few times, and we'd also been to the ED once with her, um, and sort of wasn't coming right, and sort of looking to see what was going to happen. When quite suddenly on on one day things escalated a bit dramatically and um, her heart rate shot up to 226 beats per minute. Um, we had a pulse oximeter at home, which I'd bought because, you know, being unwell for eight weeks, we thought it would be a good idea to, to monitor. Um, she called me, told me, you know, that her heart <clears throat> was at 226. She actually said, I don't know if this thing's right because I don't know if it can go this high, but it says 226. And I said, no, it can go up to 250. So, um, we better get an ambulance, and uh, we did do, and um, the ambulance came, and they they rushed her off to the emergency department, and um, from there, the doctors did some tests and so forth, and um, they decided to keep her at um, Wanganui Hospital in a, in a medical ward um, just while they were waiting to get her down to the cardiac unit in Wellington. <clears throat> yeah, well, that would have been um, quite a shock, really quite a stressful situation to be in um, but yeah just with the theme that God is always working um, did you witness or experience this working during this hard time yeah yeah obviously you know we can go through difficult things um, this being you know something that's difficult I found that um, uh, God um, gave me the strength to deal with what we were facing um, I witnessed the strength in my children, you know, um, one being 16, nearly 17, Kelly being 19. It was amazing how they both sort of had this calm, pressured state about them themselves all the way from the beginning, all the way through. Um, they would have probably been, you know, worried to some degree, but they stepped up, um, they worked, they put their hands to the plow that was before them, so to speak. <clears throat> I also witnessed God showing his love towards us um, through our church. Many of um, our, our brethren, our brothers and sisters made contact, they wished us well. I know that they were praying, they let us know that they were praying often for us. Um, some even, you know, when we got back, um, made soup and, and food and, and things like this. And, you know, that's just just an awesome thing to, to be able to see, you know. And it sort of, you know, gives you a bit of a perspective about the body of Christ, which you might not know, you know, before that, you know, you know, the Bible tells us that when one part of the body is hurting, then we all hurt. And, you know, you can sort of think, yeah, maybe, you know, but um, it's really nice to to see how how effective the body that is within our church um, reacted to the, you know, the knowledge that Corin was unwell. Um, and when I think about that, it shouldn't be difficult to think that this is the way it's going to go because, you know, we know that the body um, of Christ um, is, is sort of identified a little bit like our human bodies that, you know, everything's very closely linked and, and talking to, you know, different parts of the body are very close. So probably shouldn't have been surprised about that. Another way that um, God um, showed love and support and he was working you know in in the situation was that um you know like most christians i've got different apps on my phone and and things like that and all of a sudden the messages that were coming um through those various apps and stuff were ones that we needed to hear in this situation um so we were hearing scriptures like um all things work for good um i will never leave you nor forsake you um, God is never very far from those who love him. And, and a few more that I, that I can't remember right now. God also helped me with um, the presence of mind to be thinking about what needs to be done and to, to avoid errors. Um, he helped me bring to remembrance the things that doctors needed to know because it's, it's rather amazing how no one reads notes. 
um, and you'd have to go over, you know, what's been done and said so far and just sort of challenging them in their thinking um, so that, you know, they, they don't make mistakes as well. I, I remember um, recently one doctor wanted to put Karen on some steroids and I said to her, so does steroids not act a little bit like adrenaline? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's how they act. I said, and adrenaline, you know, gets the heart moving faster. Should we maybe not be avoiding steroids? And uh, yeah, she wasn't able to sort of reply to that one very well because she clearly got that wrong. Um, and, you know, God is amazing. You know, he, he also helped me have the courage to talk to Karen in relation to what she was going through and gave me the right words to say at the right time. Um, he, he allowed me to say to Karen he, um, that it doesn't matter what the body is going through. You know, it's, it's Father God that controls the breath of life. It's his breath of life. It's with us until he decides that it's no longer going to be with us. And um, for this reason, it doesn't matter what, you know, the heart was doing. Karen was going to survive unless he decided that he was going to take back his, his breath of life. Um, we also chatted in relation to um, where she is as, as far as, um, you know, being in Christ. And I, I've, I'm, I'm very sure that Karen is saved and, you know, um, I didn't think that there'd be a problem there, but it's always good to just make sure. And, you know, um, we didn't know at one stage how things were going to turn out. And I, I remember saying to Corin, you know, if there's anything or even things that you are not aware of, you know, it could be a good thing, you know, now just to say, hey, Lord, if it's if it's that time, um, please do forgive me for all the things that I don't know about. And, um, you know, therefore, you know, sort it out with God. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting, Guy, um, just listening to what you're sharing there. Um, there seemed to be like a, a continual theme of God working in the form of communication like with everything that you were sharing from um, you felt that communication coming from God, from mm. the word that you kept hearing. And then, you know, you've, you had that supportive communication and an act, but like mostly because we went together, you know, it was, it was communication through texts or I guess um, talking to people and just feeling the body showing that form of love. Well, that's God working through the, through the body, isn't it? Amen. Support, yeah, definitely. Support the members of the body. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you being able to communicate, God quickening those things to you with the doctors and then also um, with Karen, you know, and just, like yeah my heart goes out to you because to even have that conversation with your wife you know the one that you love so much it like that alone is a big enough challenge so yeah thank you for sharing with us how God worked with Karen and you and your family during what was obviously a hard and, and quite a, a fairly private situation so um, Guy was there anything else that God you felt was doing at that time yeah so um we we sort of finished now with the emergency department and as I sort of mentioned um Corinne ended up in a, a medical ward um she was placed on um an ECG sort of permanently because they didn't have a lot to go on and they were trying to capture you know information that they could send down with Corinne to the cardiac unit whenever she was going to end up down there and um so Karen's now in a, a four bedroom ward and she's the only lady in there. There's three other sort of older men in there, um, which was interesting because it's not the norm. Um, but, you know, clearly beds were a bit short on, on this particular day. And um, this was how things were going to play out. And we'd been visiting Karen and um, we'd, you know, gone home and it was sort of, getting closer to sort of going asleep time. And I got a text from Corin and she said, I've just heard the old man next to me praying aloud to God. And, um, you know, this, this intrigued me and obviously gave Corin a lot of, um, you know, uh, courage and support and, and just, you know, was showing her that, that God is close, you know. And um, as I mentioned, it triggered in me to be thinking about, you know, there's, there's a child of God right next door to Corinne. We didn't even know, you know? And um, yeah, so, so that was interesting. And, and I thought to myself, well, I'm gonna chat to this gentleman tomorrow. I'm gonna take the opportunity just to speak to him and, and, and see 
you know, where he's at and, and find out how he's doing and so forth. And the opportunity came up because Karen had to go for um, another test. She was going to go for um, a heart echo, um, which was probably going to take, I don't know, about half an hour or so. So I thought I'd just sit there where Karen's bed was. And um, as she left, I decided to sort of go and peer behind the veil, so to speak. And uh, yeah, there was the, the the elderly gentleman lying there. Um, he he looked quite frail to me, quite old. And um, so I sort of motioned a bit closer because I thought he might be a, um, a little bit hard of hearing. And um, he was. And this is probably why he spoke aloud, you know, um, because, you know, it's sort of commonly known as, as people lose their hearing that they talk louder um, and they sometimes forget that they're speaking aloud um, instead of speaking within their own minds. But God used this to, um, to bless my wife and to bring about, you know, an opportunity. So I just motioned closer and I spoke quite loud and I said to him, so you're a Christian. And he sort of looked at me with a bit of a sheepishy look on his face and said, yeah. And I said, uh, well, I just want you to know that um, God loves you and that he hears your prayers and that um, my wife heard you praying as well. And um, that was a great encouragement for her and for me. And um, I then said to him, I might never see you again um, at this side of, of, of the kingdom, but I look forward, if I don't see you again this side, to seeing you in the kingdom. And um, he said, too right, and he pumped his hand in the air, and I said, yeah, and he said, yeah. And it's one of those moments where we were sort of, you know, quite happy about what had been said. I went back to sitting um, and waiting for Corin, and um, I was just running through what had just happened in my head, you know. And um, I was just thinking, you know, it was so cool um, that God allowed us to have this opportunity to be encouraged, but to also be an encouragement to another child of God who had he not done what he did, we not done what we did, we'd have just, you know, passed, you know, and, and never known, you know. And it sort of testifies to, to God, he's got his finger on everything. He knows who's who and, and who isn't. And, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's very capable of, of um, bringing about situations. So thinking a little bit further into this, I thought, well, here we are in the middle of, um, you know, a, a sort of a bad situation with Kyron's heart and so forth. And um, God had provided an opportunity for a little bit of work and for things to be shown, you know, that things are working for good for those who love the Lord, you know. And I just remember sort of this feeling of urgency coming over me that during this instance, this episode of Karen's illness, um, that God would show me the good. If, if there's going to be more good, I'd like to see it, you know. And if there's more work to be done, that um, he would provide for that work and allow us to be the ones that, you know, use what's happening to, to, to his glory. And I actually prayed about it. I said, Lord, um, you know my heart's desire. I, I want to talk to your children. You've you've given me things to say, and um, yeah. So Lord, we're up for that. Mm. That's um, yeah. I'm quite blessed in hearing that guy. Like I think it's just such a testimony to your character. To be honest, um, like you know, it's so easy when things are hard in your own world that that can consume you. You know, and, it, and you can sometimes feel like that's all you can think about and just the stress of that and you, here you are and you 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 have that um, sensitivity that God's in everything he's always at work and being open to being used during you know what's quite a vulnerable time uh, and you know just thinking about that man you know just those few words you spoke there was mutual encouragement wasn't there because in that moment you're not alone that there are other Christians that are also suffering in that moment and, and indirectly through him praying and then you speaking, you both were strengthened and encouraged. And, and that's once again, just that element of being in the body of Christ, isn't it? You know, we are there to hopefully encourage and strengthen others and, and think about others, not just ourselves. So um, thank you for sharing that. Um, so Guy, was there more that God was wanting to have happen in this situation? 
Yeah, there was, and and obviously we're we're going to talk a bit further about that. So um, the next day was Easter Friday. Karen was flown um, in the morning to the cardiac unit for further assessment and treatment and so forth. We as a family, me, my daughter, um, Kelly, my son, Neil, we uh, were going to travel down by car. We, we chose to take two cars because we didn't know how long we were going to be there. I might have to come back, etc. And so we're driving along, we're driving along. I'm in the lead car. Um, Kelly's behind me with Neil, with her. And um, this sort of thought popped into my head in relation to Nando's chicken. Now, this is going to sound really odd, but... Um, Bear with me and, and remember this part of the story for later. So um, Nando's Chicken down in Wellington is a, a restaurant that cooks some really nice chicken and chips. And um, uh, we as a family, if we're in Wellington, we like to go there because it's, it's really nice. And uh, this thought popped into my head, we're going to Wellington. We're going to get to have Nando's again. And I didn't sort of recognize it at the time for what it was, but it was a, a prompting of God. And um, not just a, you know, a thought of, oh, we're going to Wellington, we're going to have some chicken, it's going to be great. Um, so I text my son um, just to say, Nando's chicken. And um, I hardly pushed go and then the phone rang and Neil's on the phone, you know, on speakerphone with Kelly and he says, Dad, you won't believe we were just talking that Nando's chicken's in Wellington and we hope, you know, that Dad takes us for Nando's chicken at some point while we're down here. So... This, this, this was all cool and we decided, you know, that night after we'd seen mum that we, we would go and to, to, to go there to have um, Nando's chicken. Um, so got down to Wellington, saw mum. She was, you know, in her own sort of room at that stage. Um, she had her own bed, she had a beautiful view, et cetera. So she was quite um, happy and content at that stage. So she was happy for us not to spend a lot of time with her and um, we had Nando's chicken to go and get as well. So it was, um, you know, one thing that was going to happen. So we left and off we went to Nando's chicken. So when we got to Nando's chicken, um, we, we came across a, a, a bit of a catastrophe. Um, we were talking to the manager and he said to us that we can't have any chips and, you know, Nando's chicken and chips isn't quite Nando's chicken and chips if you're not having chips. But he said, um, the fryer is broken, so no chips tonight. Uh, we had a we chat amongst ourselves and we said, well, chicken on its own at Nando's is pretty good anyway. So that's what we got. So that's as much as I'm going to say about Nando's chicken at this stage. And uh, um, they will sort of come into the story again a little bit later. The next day, Corin got moved um, from her own private hospital room into one that um, was shared with another lady. And this lady happened to also come from um, our hometown, Wanganui. Um, Corin and her um, obviously greeted each other and started some conversations, et cetera. And um, over time, you know, Corin mentioned, you know, a little bit about God because she's, you know, that type of person. She's very quick to speak of of god and positive things you know even when times are hard and um karen said to me later um that as they were about to turn in to go to sleep the lady said to her um i think there's a reason why you've been put in the room with me um so this was interesting for karen she let me know and um I, I sort of was thinking that maybe there could be a bit more to be, you know, expressed here, you know, to be spoken about as far as God and Christianity. And um, in the, the days that came, um, those opportunities did come. And the lady had lots and lots of questions about God, Christianity, church. Um, and I was really blessed because, you know, while we have a lot of knowledge, because, you know, in our church, we're, we're taught a lot about the Bible and so forth, to be able to express this in the correct way to a person who has specific answers that they need can sometimes not come across well. But um, God was obviously involved. You know, if you think about her being put in the room next to Corin, um, Corin and her talking, and then me coming along, um, God speaking through me to to give her the answers that she she needed 
on Easter Sunday, I had arranged to come into the hospital and to set up my laptop so we, as a family, me, Corinne, and my children could attend um, our church service because our church does put our services online. And um, we did this in the Fauna room, which, you know, is the family room. And um, <clears throat> basically, it was just us in there and some other people popped in every now and then. They got to hear some stuff as well, which hopefully that um, may have, you know, impacted upon them. But we were away from Corin's hospital room for probably about an hour and a half. And um, the hospital has this policy that only one person um, can visit a particular patient at any one time. So when this was finished, Corin was feeling a little bit tired and um, she decided she wanted to go back to a hospital room. So I walked back and as we sort of came back into a hospital room, you, you hear the voice from the other lady from behind a curtain saying, and where have you been? Were you out to lunch? And um, I said to her, no, no, um, actually, we, we were at church. And, you know, she was inquisitive to how we would go to church when we we're in hospital. And I said, well, I brought my laptop in and we do online services, etc. I had been thinking about um, our soapbox um, church that we do online later that day. And I was thinking, God, is there a way that you could, you know, bring about that she would watch that, you know, that, you know, we can do this for her. And here it was, you know, the lady had said, have you guys been away for, for lunch? And then we get talking about online and I tell her about the soapbox and that I could bring the laptop in later that day for her and Karen to watch. And um, she said, yes, she would. And uh, interesting that it was um, Easter weekend. And um, as you would probably know, John had um, prepared a, a questions and answer situation in and around, you know, Easter, what his true meaning is, um, Jesus, his death, his resurrection, um, about the Jewish people, how important the Jews are, and so forth. And um, this really impacted on her when, when we were finished. She said, I, I had no idea. I, you know, uh, she said, the things that I heard today, I've never heard before. And she was, she was quite surprised and amazed. This led to more conversation and her opening up, and she shared with me that about three years prior to this, um, a doctor, a specialist of some sort had said to her that she only has three months to live. Um, and this is probably quite some hard news to get, but she, she remembered that thinking at the time, well, if I only got three months to live, I better get baptized. And um, she sort of explained that she'd started to get this organized. And um, then the thought came to her that she's a hypocrite. She's only getting baptized because she's about to die. And, um, you know, she felt probably quite guilty about that and decided to put it off. But our Father God knew that she had um, sort of made that decision. And, you know, um, here we are a number of years later and, you know, clearly she's still alive. Um, and she hadn't got baptized at that stage when she first um, thought about doing it. And as I mentioned earlier, like obviously I can't speak on the behalf of God, but here she is still alive. And, you know, God who controls the, the breath of life, you know, hasn't taken that away from her yet. And um, yeah, it's just an awesome thing to, to be a part of, you know. Um, she did tell us that um, at, in April of this year, the beginning of April, that she did get baptized. Um, and that was nice to hear. Um, I, obviously, at that stage, I was thinking, well, I wonder if her baptism was done correctly, because that's one of the things that we like to sort of try and make sure of is that um, baptism is done as biblically correct as, as possible. Um, but I didn't feel the urgency at this stage to sort of badger her about that. Um, and so I, I didn't. I thought maybe it would come up later. Um, however, God uh, had other plans. And only a few hours later, um, she had <clears throat> a new nurse for that night who was going to take care of her. And it turned out that um, this nurse was from Ethiopia. Um, so obviously, I could clearly see that she wasn't from New Zealand. And I asked her. <clears throat> she told me she was from Ethiopia. Um, we know that many Ethiopians are of, um, 
of, of a Christian mindset. So I felt quite, you know, at ease to say to her, so are you a Christian? And she said, yes, I am. And um, this led to me chatting to her about where in the Bible, you know, people from Ethiopia are spoken of um, in the word of God. And she found this interesting. Um, and then I sort of felt this, this sort of urgency to talk to her about um, baptism. So I said to her, and, you know, you'd be baptized. And she said, oh, yeah, 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 definitely baptized, you know. I said, oh, that's wonderful. I said, so when was that, you know, expecting to hear what I heard, which was oh, I was very young, you know, and, um, yeah, I was baptized when I was very young. And um, I was able to then explain to her that, you know, children um, can't really be baptized um, because, the, the word of God tells us that you have to um, believe, repent, and then be baptized. And, and also that infant sprinkling isn't the way that Jesus got baptized. You know, we, we read of him coming up out of the water, you know, and, and other things in relation to his baptism. She saw this and um, uh, we later found out that uh, um, she was working that night and we were never going to see her again. Um, as far as we know, because we, um, Karim was going to get discharged the next day. And I just, yeah, just the whole thing was just so well organized by God. You know, we've got the lady who's just been recently baptized that I um, hadn't, you know, taken the opportunity to ask her about her baptism, hearing me explain to somebody else who's a child of God about correct baptism. So, almost sort of like coining that phrase, two birds with one stone, quite, quite amazing. Um, and yeah, so that was, that was great. And I went home and, you know, you're, you're going through this and you're like, my wife is sick and there's all this stuff going on from God. And it's, it's a, it's an unusual sort of feeling like you're, you're keen and you're up for the task that God is presenting before you as you go, yet you still need to be sensitive to the needs of, of, of my wife, Karen, and, and keeping up with the doctors and, yeah, just a, an incredible sort of time. So the next day comes along and um, we're sort of getting ready to be kicked out of the hospital, um, get discharged. And we're still having some conversations um, with the, the lady that was in the room with Karen. And um, she pipes up and she says, oh, I, I heard you talking about baptism to my nurse last night. And I, I just want you to know that I was fully immersed, baptized, and that it was done correctly because of what you said. Mine was done exactly the same. And I thought that was just so really cool that she wanted us to know, you know, um, and Obviously, God had been in that whole thing and, and he'd known what her response was going to be and um, just amazing sort of um, testimony and, you know, glory to God that he's just, he just knows everything and he's just got everything under his control and, and he's working, you know. So, um, yeah, um, basically, we're, we're sort of getting ready to leave. And it's getting closer and closer to the time of us to do that. Um, and we said our goodbyes to the lady. Um, we made a, a commitment to, you know, meet up again and have some more chats and so forth. Um, that has happened. And um, we're hoping that, you know, what she said, which was she'd like to come to our church and, and maybe attend a few meetings and, and see how things go, that, um, this, would, that this would happen. Over to you, Lunor. Thanks, Guy. Um, yeah, just thinking about everything you, you're sharing, you know, like one hospital venture, two rooms, and already three people, you know, God has, has reached out to um, through your experience. And, yeah, just amazing the way the Lord works. And um, if you, yeah, have an open open heart how he will open those doors and you were still able to share what you wanted to say but by waiting on the Lord you know he opened those doors you didn't have to force it upon them so it's just fascinating um and praise God for the work that he can do through us um 
So it sounds like a lot was done in the hospital, Guy, um, with Karen being discharged. I guess the work maybe you felt was was all over and you could just come home. Yeah, unfortunately, um, Karen was discharged quite late in the day. Um, you know, you're waiting for the cardiologist and, and people to sign bits of forms and so forth. So we were going to stay um, in Wellington that night um, because we just thought it was better. Um, there was also that feeling of, um, well, what if they've got it wrong? We'd rather be really close to the cardiac unit um, than, you know, halfway home. Um, so we were going to stay the night. Um, um, when Karen was about to be um, properly discharged, I, I remember going through the doors out into reception and um, I saw um, probably a family, you know, it was a couple of ladies and a couple of guys, and they were very, very well dressed. And um, I sort of motioned over to them and I said, oh, you guys got some really nice clothes on today. It looks like you're out in your Sunday best. And um, they sort of looked at me like I was a madman. And uh, <laughs> um, one of the ladies sort of, you see this bit of courage come across her face and she sort of pulls her shoulders back and she says, well, we were at church today worshipping our father, you know, and um, she, she, she wanted to sort of tell me this, in, I guess, in case I was um, maybe not a Christian. Um, and I responded to her and, and, the, and those that were sitting there and I said, um, so I guess today you were in the house of the Lord celebrating the fact that Jesus has risen, you know, and um, at this they all smiled and they were a lot more happier and um, sort of, yeah, our Lord is a risen Lord, you know, and I don't know what was going on before. It's not my place to, to guess, but they're sitting outside um, the cardiac unit at Wellington Hospital and they can only let one person in at a time to see a patient. So I'm guessing they're going in one at a time to see somebody that they care about. And before this, they weren't talking, their heads were hung over. Um, I didn't see any smiles, but um, once we'd had our little conversation, you know, hopefully they were uplifted and, and feeling a lot better about that. So at this stage, Corin does get um, discharged and uh, we're walking out of the hospital and so forth. And um, the kids are telling Corin, you know, what we've been doing for the three or four days. And um, Nando's chicken got brought up again. And uh, so Corin says, oh, you guys had Nando's chicken without me. And we said, yes, you know, oh, okay, well, I guess we're going to have to have Nando's chicken again tonight because I feel like Nando's chicken tonight. And, you know, I was sort of like, yeah, Nando's is good, but they haven't got any chips. And I said to them, guys, they don't have any chips, you know, Nando's chicken and chips, no chips. But we decided to hatch the plan that we'll get Nando's chicken and then we'll go somewhere else for chips. And then maybe we'll go down to the beach where we can um, eat the Nando's chicken and chips. So this is where I said to use, remember the Nando's a chicken and chips story because it's not over. So we get there and um, we get met by somebody who says, you know, take a seat, go up and order your food. So the family said, I knew what we wanted. So I went up to the counter and I met this guy at the counter who was going to take my order. He's a blonde headed youngish sort of chap. Um, I later found out that his name's Ryan. And um, so I'm about to place my order and I say to him, is there any chance you guys have got the fryer fixed? And um, he said, yeah, no, we got it fixed today. And I don't believe I was in control at this point. It was, it was the sort of thing that you just don't do happened. And I stuck up my right hand into the air, pointing towards heaven. <clears throat> and I said, Yahweh fixed your fryer. And if you think about it, you know, there's not a lot of Christians that know that God has a name and his name is Yahweh, let alone, you know, possibly people of the world. But as I said this, Yahweh fixed your fryer, this, this sort of funny look on his face, a bit of like, like conviction came over his face as I did this. And this triggered in me to ask the question, you know, how do you know that? And then he finished my sentence, the name of God is Yahweh. And this was, this was a bit crazy, you know. Um, so I'd seen this in his face and I, and I just followed on and I said, um, are you a Christian? And he sort of hung his head a little bit, a little bit of guilt came over his face and he said, 
Well, not practicing. Um, I was raised in a Christian family. Um, my parents are Christians, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not practicing. And I said to him, um, that's okay. I says, you know, at, at some point, all of us, you know, we'll go through difficult times in, a, in our walk. Um, but you just need to remember that God loves you. And all you have to do is cry out to him and say, Lord, you know, I want to get back to the way things should be, the way that you want them to be. And I'm sorry. And, you know, he'll forgive you in, in quicker than a heartbeat, you know. Um, and we carried on chatting a little bit. And he sort of gave me the feeling that he wasn't sure that God existed, but that if God did exist, he'd want to know. So I said to him, you know, we've got this really, really thin book. You can read it quickly. And it gives you all the evidence, you know, that proves that God does exist, you know. And um, I could send this book to you, you know. And I was just about to sort of ask him, would you like the book when we got interrupted? You know, there was other customers and the manager was sort of looking at giving us the evil eye. So <clears throat> I had to, to move away. And um, I went back to the table. Because of this, I said to the family, I think we're staying here. Uh, we're going to eat our food here. One, we had the chips, and two, now we've got Ryan to possibly chat to. Um, so we did. Um, but the restaurant got a lot busier, a lot fuller. Um, I was looking at Ryan every now and then just to sort of read what was going on in his face. And I didn't sort of pick up that he did or didn't want me to come and talk to him any further. Um, and I'm sitting there weighing this through my head. And, and a couple of times I sort of thought to myself, well, do I go and carry on the conversation? And I, I said to myself, no, um, it's, it's maybe for Ryan to come to you now and, and, and make the, the choice, you know. Um, we got to the end of the food. Um, the, the question went through my head again. I said no. And, and then I just felt this urgency come over me again. And I thought, no, nah, I've got to go speak to this chap, you know. So I got up out of my chair and I just walked straight up to him. Um, I don't know if anybody else was waiting to speak to him or not. And I just said, Ryan, do you want that book? And um, the relief that came across on his face was, was the first thing that I noticed. And then he said, yes, I, I want that book. And, you know, in my head, the job's kind of done at this stage. I'm turning around to go. And, and he says to me, but where are you going to send it? And I just turned around and I said to him, Ryan, I know where you are. You're at Nando's Chicken in Wellington. I'm just going to send the book here. Oh, okay, that's good. I'll put your name on it. We'll get the book to you. And, you know, job's done. Praise the Lord. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so, Guy, you know, you've shared and we've heard of some examples of God using Karen's illness to work in and through you both. Um, when you say God is always at work, is it only in these miraculous occurrences? <clears throat> For me, Lenore, I believe everything that God has done, is doing, will do, is miraculous. Uh, we need to remember that before creation, there was nothing. God performed a miracle, which led to us seeing everything that is around us today, as well as all the things that has happened in the past and all the things that are going to happen in the future. And it's because of who is doing the working, not through whom or in whom, Whatever he puts his mighty hand to, whether small or large in our eyes, I see and I believe is miraculous. While these examples um, that we've been speaking about today did happen, and, you know, they're sort of outside of the norm, they could be attributed to minor miracles, I believe this to be a limited view of God's working and performing miracles all day long. I believe looking and seeking his miraculous hand and what he is busy doing around us, for us, for our church, in our families, etc., is of great benefit to us and pleases him to no end. After all, we are told in John 17, verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We also read at Psalm 34, verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Looking for the working of God is one of the ways that we can taste and see God. 
get to know him, which would be of a help towards eternal life. But what could we expect to taste and see? We read at Psalm 18, verse 35, that God's kindness, his gentleness, has made me great. Here the word great can be translated um, in other words, like um, make us excel, make us increase, or even cause us to grow up. So when we look for the ever busy father and the work he is doing, he sees us tasting and seeing. He responds by allowing us to see him more and more. And what do we see? We see his gentleness and kindness towards us, which causes us to respond with more love, more appreciation, more obedience, which works out um, to be helping us towards eternal life and pleasing him more and more. Mm, I'm into that guy. Um, Guy, can you tell us of any other examples of where you see these miraculous occurrences? <clears throat> yeah, um, th there'd be probably quite a few places that I could sort of list, but one of the best places, um, which I think will be of the most help to, to others, is, is to just sort of um, talk about our church. So in our church, God is working all the time. Um, when we gather to worship him and to hear from him, um, we see him working and, and I'm really fortunate because I run one of the Sunday school classes, which means my Sunday with God starts early. And typically this is how it goes for me on, on a Sunday with God. We'll, we'll get to Sunday school and John McIver, the head of our Sunday school, who's also one of our elders, starts the Sunday school and zeroes in on a topic or something that God has laid on his heart to share. We all get to listen to this and usually sing a song pertaining to what he has shared. And what's amazing is that this work of God is designed by God to taste good for the young and the old. What he has shared will either lead into what I'm going to be speaking about in my class that I run or trigger a prompting from God to do something completely different than what I had planned to do, but God will still lead into that class. After Sunday school, we have our main church meeting, which um, starts off usually with the, the person who's leading, delivering a small message or a prayer that, you know, is on his heart, that's been put there by God. Um, then we sing some songs, you know, the songs have been chosen by God, you know, maybe penned by, you know, who the leader is that day, but God has chosen those songs. Um, and they'll have the, the same message, you know, um, then we'll have the message from the speaker, and that is usually about the same message, uh, maybe a little bit fuller, a bit deeper, drawing on um, other parts of scripture and things that correlate or are aligned with that message. Um, then we'll go into the bread and the wine, and quite often, you know, as we remember Jesus, then in that message, there's something that we can remember Jesus for. Um, we'll um, sing some more songs. Once again, those songs, you know, by the providence of God are, are able to minister to us along the same subject. Um, and then we have um, the close of the meeting. And yeah, we just are able to see if we want to the hand of God, um, his spirit moving amongst many people that have um, not got together and purpose what it is that, you know, we're going to be teaching or hearing on, on the day. And I guess we shouldn't be surprised by this um, because when we think about how big a task was involved in the setting up of God's word, our, our Bible, um, you know, it was penned, you know, by the inspiration of God by many, many people over many thousands of years. I mean, some people had come and gone, they were dead, and then others were you know, working on, on, on parts that we're going to end up in the Bible later, you know, thousands of years. So, you know, for God to just work within our church, um, it's, it's certainly not a hard thing for him. No, and, you know, just thinking about what shared there, Guy, you know, we often talk about, like, how God layers, that layering of a message, mm. um, Affirming that it is from the Lord and and the truth that it is within that, um, and I mean we know that through Scripture that you know we, to have the truth we've got to confirm Scripture with Scripture and and you know the whole Bible how it pointed forth to Christ it was that layering and yeah 
all the time um confirming the word and yeah I totally agree with you guy you know I think the thought that comes to mind for me is that we've just got to be open to receive it you know God can't speak to us unless we're open and, and looking and mm. he will certainly reward us for that you know but um you know simple things like you know I have like a little word for the day that pops up on my phone well if I didn't install the app I wouldn't get that message but often that message might have connected to the readings that I did the day before but if I didn't read I wouldn't get that connection and that's you know I guess the encouraging factor about even us going to church you know like by participating being part of the body we can experience that miracle of God working through our lives individually and as a body and just that continual layering and affirmation of God's word in our lives um yeah it's a real blessing when you can experience that and and I think it's in those moments that you really have that confirmation that that God is working in your life um I was there a time when you didn't see these miracles for what they are and if so how did you start to yeah, it's a good question, Lenore. Um, so in the very early stages of joining our church, um, when I was sort of in my mid-30s, um, I, I could be what you would call um, a babe in Christ, a newbie, um, and, and to be honest, pretty dumb. So in those very early stages, you know, I had no idea, you know, um, and you don't know what you don't know. Um, so yeah didn't didn't see those sort of things happening but god knows us and he knows what we need and over time um he's going to deliver that um and he educated me about himself um, showed himself to me and um this should cause in us to to want to know him more to to go seeking for him um wanting to taste um of his goodness and and to to serve him even more and and then to, you know, find the talents that he's put inside you um, that are there for his glory and want to use those to, to bring more glory. And I, and I say that phrase because we can't actually bring more glory, but there is glory that's available to God that he's put in place that, you know, he wants people to participate in so that, you know, um, he gets more glory. And to also be edifying to um, the brethren and the children that, that, um, are his you know when I look back on it now it, it seems quite simple and logical but in those days because you don't know you you just don't know and and you you have to be taught but it can take quite a while to learn this um, now I'm at a stage where um, before the meetings I will pray regularly and because um, I know that God is going to be there um, and that there's things that need um, to come out I will I will say to Father God I'll say Lord I want to see you um, I'm not being demanding or and having a bad attitude I'm just saying Lord I want to see you I want to see you working you know I seek the giver not the gift you know um, and Lord if it's you know that you want something to be said or prayed about in the meeting um, you know just Put it upon my heart tell me you know what it is that you want to say and um the the reason why we we should want to you know participate in these meetings is to edify and it's amazing how edifying it is when when people are being used by god um and and you are of the of the mindset to be looking for god and then you see god working through somebody and it edifies and it's like this you know we talk about downward spiral but it's like this is an upward spiral you know it's just positivity and edifying and glory for god just all building you know towards towards our our father in heaven mm. but have you run into any barriers and setbacks yeah that's a good question um <laughs> So there'd be there'd be a lot because um, you know we're 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 not perfect um, and and I guess probably the one that I'd speak of today is myself. Um, unfortunately, for most of us, it takes a very long time to to learn of our inner devil. And I'm I'm not speaking of what most of Christianity thinks the devil is. I'm speaking of my own sinful nature and how devious and deceitful it can be. It doesn't want us to please God. 
It doesn't want you to excel and it, it doesn't want you to grow up and it will do its best to hold you back. It will tell you all manner of lies um, to achieve this. And because we're inexperienced and quite often only too happy to remain dumb and inexperienced, we allow it to rule our thinking, um, which in turn, you know, rules our actions, you know, things like don't do that, you'll look odd and stupid to everybody. Don't do that, you'll appear super spiritual and fake. Don't do that, everyone will think you're trying to look grand. Don't do that, you're not good enough. You're not clever enough, you're not learned enough. And the list goes on and I'm, I'm sure as you are sitting listening to this, you'll, you'll be identifying this voice, you know, of, um, um, of the devil, of this, this evil nature that we have with inside us. And for a lot of Christians, um, this traps them and they don't progress, they don't grow up, they don't go forward and they don't get to experience the freedom and the boldness that we can have in our, in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus. But when you realise you're never going to be good this side of the kingdom and it's all about God and not you and not what others think about you or what you've done, um, things that you've actually been forgiven of, things start to change. You become more confident, bolder. You step out in faith more often. And as you do this, this faithfulness that you show in small things leads to being, you know, more faithful in bigger things. It's, it's, a, it's a promise of God. Mm. A couple of scriptures that come to mind that are worthy of, of being mentioned at this stage. Um, Proverbs 23, verse 7, for as the thoughts of his heart are, so he is. If we are thinking good things like all that God does is good, that God is always busy working things for my good, thinking of looking to see God working, then we will become what we are thinking, a person who is looking for God's working and doing good towards us. God tells us that it's part of his will for us to know him. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not and unto thine own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. Here we read that acknowledging God in all our ways leads to God directing our paths. Who would not want God to be directing us? But here it's dependent on us acknowledging God in all our ways. If we're not seeing God in more and more in our ways, how would we be increasingly acknowledging him and then reaping the benefit of him more and more directing our paths. Thanks, Lil. Makes me also think, um, just in closing, Guy, of that scripture in Philippians 4, verse 8. Um, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Um, so thank you so much for what you've shared today, Guy. I'm sure we've all been richly blessed by the experience that you had um, with Karen and, and we will you know, continue to pray for her health to be restored. But yeah, like you said at the start, we've got to trust that all things are work together for good and for God's glory. And I think with what you've shared today, we can already see how with the situation of parents' health, God has surely been at work and in using it for good and to his glory. Awesome. Thank you for that, Lenore. Um, yeah, I did enjoy sharing today and uh, it was really nice that you could help us um, with the questions. We, we come to the stage now where... Um, you know, it's definitely not about us. It's, it's about our Lord and Saviour um, and um, his obedience. Um, we know that Jesus had a connection with God that um, was second to none. You know, um, I've heard some of the elders in our church, you know, even say it wouldn't surprise them if he wasn't constantly talking to God, you know, in, in, in his mind, that he had that level of connection to God. And um, when you think about what Jesus endured um, to be able to go through his whole life, let alone those last couple of days, um, you'd, be, you'd be wanting 
to sort of know that, you know, he had it all under control. Um, and obviously God, who whose plan it was that Jesus would um, be our savior, um, be the sacrifice that he was, um, give his life to atone for all of the wrongdoings that um, mankind has done throughout the history. Um, yeah, it's an awesome and a fantastic thing to, to think of. And we just, we remember Jesus for so many things, but today for that relationship that he had with his father, you know, that we may one day too um, have that relationship with our father God, so close and so intimate. And at this stage, I'd just like to call upon um, our sister Candice just to <laughs> pray over the bread and the wine, and then um, we'll partake of that. Thank you. Dear God, today, 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 sorry, today we gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ to remember the extraordinary sacrifice you made in sending Jesus. You feed our souls, you nourish our hearts, and give us the sustenance to run the race before us. No matter what we may have to endure, you always show us your way and your plan for us, Lord God. As we take this bread, remember that you are the bread of life, and as we drink this wine, which represents the blood poured out for, for us, we do this in remembrance of, of him. In the name of your son, our saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Candice.